This week on ANN, wildfires in California force evacuations from Adventist-run institutions. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency in Lebanon works to provide relief after a deadly explosion. And Advent Health in Colorado is caring for team members. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, as of Friday, August 21st, several Adventist entities and institutions in Northern California have been evacuated due to wildfires that began several days ago when an unusual heat wave and storms in the region produced more than 10,000 lightning strikes. The LNU Lightning Complex fire is a group of fires burning in the same region that were sparked by lightning earlier this week. LNU stands for Cal Fires Sonoma Lake Napa Unit. Reports reveal that the LNU Lightning Complex fire has burned more than 350,000 acres with 22% containment. At least four Bay Area people have been reported as dead, and several others have been injured due to the blaze. Many residents have been evacuated, including those living on and near the campus of Pacific Union College. PUC is currently under a mandatory evacuation with the surrounding Anguin community in response to the LNU Lightning Complex fire in Napa County. The evacuation is a precautionary measure as the fire could pose a threat to Anguin, where PUC is located, if it moves south. A statement shared on the college's website specified that there is currently no immediate threat to the campus and all faculty, staff, and students are safe and accounted for at this time. However, college officials shared that at least two PUC families have had their homes damaged or destroyed by the fire. Adventist Health's 151-bed St. Helena Hospital was also evacuated on August 19 after Cal Fire issued a mandatory evacuation order. In addition to the hospital evacuation, more than 300 associates were evacuated from their homes. Adventist Health is providing emergency assistance to associates in need, and the Adventist Health Rapid Response Fund is available. Elmshaven, an Adventist historical site and the former home of Adventist Church co-founder Ellen G. White, also located in St. Helena, has been evacuated. The House Museum was designated a U.S. National Historic Landmark in 1993. Although around 25 wildfires are ranging in the Northern California Conference, or NCC, no churches, schools, or properties within the NCC have been damaged. All pastors, teachers, and conference staff who were ordered to evacuate did so safely. NCC President Mark Woodson says, We are closely monitoring the situation, although some of our staff and church members have been displaced. We thank God for keeping them safe. We ask that you keep the first responders, firefighters, our institutions, and everyone impacted by the wildfires in California in your prayers. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, delivered tons of nutritional provisions on a special humanitarian flight from Slovakia as part of its expanded emergency response to help children and families affected by the devastating August 4th Beirut explosion. This latest assistance is helping ADRA expand its relief operations, which has to this point focused on providing emergency food, water, and essential supplies to victims and first responders since the day of the explosion. Emergency Management Director for ADRA, Mario Oliveira, says, We are facing an unsurmountable humanitarian crisis. Relief assistance reports indicate that close to a million people cannot afford basic needs. Even before the explosion, food security in Lebanon was a cause of serious concern. Our teams are working around the clock, assisting families and children. We are deeply grateful to our humanitarian partners for responding and pledging their support to ADRA's ongoing relief operations. The explosion killed more than 178 people, injured at least 6,000, and left some 300,000 individuals homeless. ADRA has already launched water, sanitation, and hygiene initiatives and is coordinating joint efforts with humanitarian partners to address the needs of survivors more promptly. The Relief Agency plans to work with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR, 
to assist displaced households with emergency shelter and protection assistance. At least 170,000 apartments and 150 schools, including Adra's Learning Center for Refugee Children, were damaged by the blast. The explosion damaged at least 26 hospitals and clinics, further straining medical services for coronavirus patients and the community at large. ADRA plans to continue its COVID-19 prevention initiatives to help Lebanon cope with the health challenges of the current crisis. The number of deaths and new infections has increased since the blast. The country has had more than 12,000 coronavirus cases and 123 deaths, according to the health ministry, although these numbers change daily. Emergency Response Coordinator overseeing ADRA's day-to-day -day emergency operation in Beirut, Alex Ballant, says, Our COVID-19 response projects have been serving the most vulnerable communities since the outbreak. We have shipped medical supplies and personal protective equipment, provided hygiene and sanitation, and food assistance for the elderly and refugees. We know Lebanon will need even more relief to deal with this pandemic. We learned the explosion destroyed thousands of PPEs and medical supplies that were stored in a warehouse at the port pending transfer to medical facilities. It is a challenging time to tackle COVID-19, but ADRA is committed to supporting the Lebanese community through this health crisis. To learn more about ADRA's disaster response or make donations to assist with relief efforts in Lebanon, visit adra.org slash emergency fund. As you've just heard, after the explosion in Beirut, there is a lot of work to be done to clean up the city. Seventh-day Adventists have been working in the streets to help those in need. The work has been heavy, but the reward of serving the community and giving hope to those who have lost everything is great. The Adventist Church in the Middle East and North Africa Union sent this report. on Tuesday this last week and we have a group of students from Middle East University uh, and, and some of our, our pastor, our Bushria church pastor here, Fadi, and a group from the union office and we're here just helping this community clean up, uh, picking up glass, sweeping the streets, picking up garbage and just generally cleaning things up and our people who live here in the balconies have been thanking us and are, and are appreciative and it's neat to see so many different groups from all over the place who are helping in this community. We, as a disaster happens like this year, people pull together and they help each other out and it's cool to see that. How was today? Healthcare workers continue to care for patients on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic 
while coping with added stress and impacts to their own health and well-being. Avista Adventist Hospital in Louisville, Colorado, a Centura Health faculty and member of Adventist Health's Rocky Mountain region, is caring for its team members in body, mind, and spirit with a new Oasis room based on biblical wellness principles. Advent Health brings us the report. As the COVID-19 pandemic persists, healthcare professionals experience the physical, mental, and spiritual toll of caring for patients infected with the virus. To invest in the well-being of their team members, Avista Adventist Hospital in Colorado has opened a new Oasis room, a space for staff to take a break and rejuvenate. And a room like this just gives us a chance, you a chance, to just invest in your own health and well-being, which is mind, body, and spirit. And sometimes all it takes is 15 minutes and we can go for another few hours. The Creation Life Oasis Room was inspired by the biblical wellness principles of choice, rest, environment, activity, trust in God, interpersonal relationships, outlook, and nutrition. The room features two massage chairs, calming music and lighting, and complimentary snacks. The setting is geared towards frontline staff who especially benefit from a safe and clean space to relax before returning to their shifts. For the opening of the space, a subcommittee was assembled to plan the room, furbish the space, and host a grand opening celebration complete with a ribbon cutting ceremony. Avista Adventist Hospital is a member of Centura Health, which is jointly operated by Common Spirit Health and Avent Health. Implementing creation life practices has helped Centura fuse the missions of both hospital systems, a hospital representative says. Coming up, we hear from an Adventist teacher in Brazil who went to God and got amazing results. We'll be right back after the break. Why is there evil in the world? Christians hypocrites? Is the Bible a fairy tale? Does Jesus love everyone? Church doesn't feel relevant to my life. Is God even real? You have questions? Let's talk about it. I believe Bible. Welcome back. During the COVID-19 pandemic, physical education teacher Cynthia Regina Pereira Lopez lived a prayer experience with God. More time at home due to the quarantine measures in Brazil, she was looking for a way to supplement income and contribute to the construction of an Adventist church in Manaus. After participating in an initiative that made 5,000 masks that were distributed in hospitals, she prayed to God and asked for guidance to start a new activity. The Adventist Church in Brazil sent this report. I am a professor of education, for more than 20 years, and the place where I work, the activities were closed because I work with adults, so I'm in the area of risk, and then we had to stop. And in this period, I was in home. Fiquei em casa e sem assim, perspectiva nenhuma, né? E de repente surgiu o projeto de confeccionarmos máscaras. Aí a gente foi, confeccionou 5 mil máscaras tá? para distribuir nos hospitais. Só que aí começou a diminuir a quantidade de máscaras, a gente foi concluindo o projeto e fiquei assim numa ansiedade. Meu Deus, o que é que eu vou fazer? O que, que eu vou fazer aqui dentro desse apartamento aqui? Só eu e meu esposo, que também é professor de educação física, teve que interromper as atividades dele. Assim, eu fiquei meio depressiva, né? Eu lia muito a Bíblia, mas eu não tinha muita vontade de fazer muita coisa não, sabe? Mas de repente, eu comecei a olhar para aqueles retalhos que sobraram das máscaras. Eu disse, meu Deus, me mostra o que, é que eu posso fazer com isso. E fui para o meu quarto e orei. E pedi e clamei, Senhor, me responde porque eu preciso, eu preciso até da minha parte financeira também, né? Orei, orei e dormi. Quando eu acordei, eu acordei assim com uma ideia, sabe? E fui lá num ateliêzinho que eu montei, que eu improvisei para as máscaras, né? E lá nesse ateliê eu comecei a desenhar uma pantufa. Aí fui no YouTube e também peguei lá algumas dicas e confeccionei uma, uma, uma pantufa com os retalhos. 
e peguei, enviei uma foto para minha filha para mostrar para minha neta que eu tinha feito para ela, para a Vic. E aí a minha vizinha subiu lá no meu apartamento. Quando ela viu, ela disse: "Ai, vizinha, eu quero. Faça uma para minha filha." E no mesmo dia eu confeccionei a pantufia da, da filha dela, né? Só que a minha filha, ela foi mais além, né? Ela pegou e, e ligou e disse: "Mãe, isso aí que dá para senhora ganhar dinheiro, vou colocar no, no, nas redes sociais. Aí eu falei, minha filha, eu não sei mexer muito em rede social não, mas coloca aí. Deus ele me respondeu tão rápido que eu fiquei sem, sem palavras para ele, né? Porque o nosso Deus ele é maravilhoso. Aí eu peguei, orei, agradecendo a ele, Senhor, muito obrigado, porque tu me respondeste, eu tenho certeza que tu me respondeu. E agora que a nossa igreja vai entrar em construção, aproveitando o momento de pandemia, e a igreja vai construir, me ajuda, Senhor, porque eu preciso dar uma oferta significativa para ajudar na tua obra, né? Ajudar a tua casa a ficar mais bonita. Eu nem imaginava, né, que aqui em Manaus, num lugar tão quente, alguém ia querer usar pantufa, né? Por dia, eu consigo confeccionar umas 20 pantufas, né? Aí o meu esposo, ele me ajuda bastante, né? E eu recebo, assim, encomendas de 50, 60 por semana. Aí eu separo o dízimo e separo a oferta para a construção da igreja. E cada vez que, assim, que eu separo o dízimo, que eu separo essa oferta, quando eu vou olhar no meu celular, está cheio de encomendas. Então eu sei que é Deus. Deus respondendo, Deus me ajudando, Deus mostrando para mim que Ele é Deus. Que eu posso pedir que Ele vai me ajudar. Deus responde as nossas orações e que nós temos que buscá-lo. Se nós não buscarmos, nós não vamos conseguir. Nós vamos conseguir coisas que são coisas passageiras, coisas que não são resolvidas totalmente. A oração é em primeiro lugar. Não existe outro método para nós cristãos. É a oração. Fé. Confiar. Ter fé e confiar e orar bastante e Deus responde. Nem todas as vezes é respondida no mesmo momento. A gente tem que aguardar dias, meses, anos para receber uma resposta. Mas quando vem de Deus, ela vem positiva e vem para solucionar. Coming up, David Trim is here for this week in Adventist history. Up next, Adventist Mission shares the story of missionaries in Albania. Where we are now, I listen to the room. I say to my wife, something don't go in the back. We go to the garage and we go out and see everything. Very bad. When I not come to the house, I ask the people here. Talking people, old woman, old man, baby, running in the blood. Somebody who died here, I make pressure for the heart. Half hour. I cannot stay again. I don't want to die again. Welcome back. For years, Albania was a communist territory, banning religion and declaring it's the world's first and only atheist state. But then, an Adventist missionary family packed their bags and prepared for a new adventure in the country. Adventist Mission has more. A missionary family packed their bags and prepared for a new adventure in Albania. God called Delmar, Nati, and three-year-old Clara to serve in the 1040 window. We are both from Brazil. I think God placed in our hearts the desire to serve in a different place, in a different environment, in a place where we wouldn't be like comfortable, something that will challenge both our ministries. And we realized very soon some of the challenges that we will face preaching and the gospel, bringing the gospel here to this country. For years, Albania was a communist territory, banning religion and declaring it the world's first and only atheist state. Communism collapsed in 1990, 
but even today, religion doesn't seem to be a priority for most people. There are only about 120 Adventists out of nearly 3 million people living in Albania. Delmar, Nati, and Clara were assigned to serve in the city of Korcha at the country's first Adventist church built in 1994. The first year was especially difficult. Despite their efforts, there wasn't a single baptism or anyone interested in Bible studies. In the end of my first year, I was really discouraged because I couldn't see anything really big happening in the church. You know, I couldn't see anything really even changing in the church. We associate big things with good numbers, big numbers. So in my first year, I was trying to do my best. I was working a lot to do something big or something important, according to my understanding. At the peak of Del Mar's frustration, he received a call to pastor a large church in Brazil. This offer seemed to come at the perfect time, and he shared the exciting news with his wife. I came and talked to my wife. You know, we got a call to go back to Brazil. What do you think? We're not doing anything here anyway. Why we don't accept that and we just leave? And that's it. She looked to me. She said, do you think that we did everything that we could here in Albania? Do you, do you really think that it's time for us to leave this place? She said, I personally think that we should stay, that the Lord has something prepared for us here. And maybe He wants to, to teach us something here and he, he still wants to use us. So they declined the opportunity in Brazil and prayed about how God could use them in this challenging part of the world. Delmar and Nati noticed that there were a lot of kids in their neighborhood. Maybe this was a good place to start. And then we also realized that Clara could be a good missionary to them. Because every time that uh, we were coming to our home or leaving our home, and the kids, they saw Clara, so they start saying, hey, Clara, Clara, let's play, let's do this, let's do that. We prepare like a, a place to play volleyball. And then we say to them, come, let's play together. And, and this just happened naturally. And the kids start coming to church and they start coming every week to church, like two times a week, playing volleyball, playing with us. And in a few weeks, they knew me as a pastor, they knew Nati, they knew very well Clara. And we were so excited because now the church was full. They recruited help in the form of two Adventist volunteers from Brazil and community volunteers. One of the members, Angela, brought her friend Fation to church with her every few months. Fation and I, we just connect as a friend and we start talking about God. We start studying the Bible together. I invite him to be part of our group and he just was excited. He was really engaged with us. And he said, you know, that's what I want. I want to participate. I want to help these kids. I want to serve this community. And in just a few weeks, he was already helping us with the kids, and the kids also loved him. All these activities just brought us together, and I had the privilege to baptize Fation as my first baptism here in Albania. And I was so happy to see that the Lord was answering to our prayers. The love of Jesus touched Fation's heart, and he now shares this with others. When we follow this Jesus method in other people in the community, I pray for the hearts to get warm and, and to follow Jesus. This church has seen many new faces in the past few months. Church members are connecting with the community through a global mission urban center of influence. Nati uses her gift of music to teach classes to the kids. They love learning to play the violin. The center also offers language courses and a health club with plans to branch out with more programs. So when you try something new and then you see that it's working, it already gives you like more hope. And then this also gave us motivation to try different things, not just not one approach. Please pray for this ministry as it continues to grow and integrate into the community. And pray for missionary families like Delmar, Nati and Clara who are serving on the front lines of mission. When we were called to come as a missionary, I thought that I was ready to change the world. But it took maybe one year to realize that before I do anything, the Lord was trying to change me. Thank you for supporting the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
O quê? Você gosta de morar na Albânia? Sim? Watch this and other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org. Then click on videos at the top. And finally for today's episode, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On August 24, 1874, Battle Creek College opened with 100 students. It was the fruit of vigorous fundraising by George I. Butler and Stephen N. Haskell, which resulted in the extraordinary sum of $54,000 in cash or pledges being raised in the preceding 12 months. The college evolved from a select private school started in 1868 by legendary Adventist educator Goodloe H. Bell. Battle Creek College later moved to Berrien Springs, Michigan and was renamed Emmanuel Missionary College before eventually becoming Andrews University. On August 25, 1966, Arta Wifi Adventist Hospital opened on the island of Malaita in the Solomon Islands. Construction of the first buildings was funded by the fourth quarter of 1965 13th Sabbath mission offering. Last year, this 78-bed hospital treated over 14,000 patients. On August 27, 1876, Ellen G. White addressed an audience estimated as being at between 15,000 and 20,000 people at Groveland, Massachusetts. And on the same site 12 months later, she spoke to an audience that journalists thought was even larger. Her topic on both occasions was Christian temperance. Ellen White was extremely popular as a speaker among people of all denominations and faiths in late 19th century America. Contemporary newspapers often describe how, in states that had few Seventh-day Adventists, hundreds or thousands of people would journey by horse and buggy to hear her preach or lecture on temperance or other aspects of health reform. That was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching a and Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your feedback and tell us how your church is making a difference in its community. Be sure to capture plenty of video footage and photos, then write up a summary of the event's important details. And feel free to send full video reports as well. You can reach us by sending an email to annvideo11 at gmail.com. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The passage says, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.